Welcome to today's program titled Insurance Coverage for Business Interruption Losses. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and PowerPoint presentation will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Thomas Locke. Tom, you may begin. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, welcome, everyone, to our discussion on insurance coverage for business interruption losses. We look forward to uh, giving you an overview. There's a lot to cover, and we thank you for your participation. Uh, we have a uh, COVID-19 resource center for the firm and uh, it's indicated there on the slide. So if you're interested, you can look. We have a lot of material on a wide array of topics. And the typical legal disclaimer, we're not giving legal advice. Um, he here are our speakers, in addition to myself, Rebecca Woods and Esther Slater McDonald will be speaking on the topics, and uh, this are photographs of us in our happier times. Uh, so, we're going to start uh, probably half the discussion will be about first party commercial property policies and the types of coverage that they have. We're focusing in particular on business interruption, contingent business interruption, uh, civil authority, and communicable disease coverage. We are going to address some other topics, and you see them there. Uh, we want to make sure we tell you what's going on in terms of the state and federal uh, legislative developments. And we'll talk about uh, two other kinds of first party coverage that exist. And then we'll uh, briefly discuss uh, third party liability coverage issues. So jumping into the first party um, liability coverage and specific, sorry, uh, not the liability coverage, the business interruption coverage. Um, most policies have a business interruption loss coverage part. Here's uh, an example of the language of one policy. It's important to note that these policies vary significantly and you really have to read the policy to understand what coverage you may or may not have. As we go through the hour, we will be emphasizing that and we'll be giving you examples of different property policies uh, and their business interruption loss coverage potential. So when you look at the coverage issues that are uh, involved in uh, business interruption policies and coverage, there are three broad areas, and they're listed here, and let me go through those briefly. First uh, is the type of policy. Um, getting into this in depth is beyond the scope of our discussion, but what we want to talk about is uh, just broadly, there's an all-risk policy which covers everything that's not excluded. And then there are named peril uh, policies, and those are coverage on only for specified losses like earthquake and fire and the like. Um, get, focusing now on the business interruption loss, many policies require, arguably require, uh, direct physical loss. Uh, if that is coming right from the coverage part language. So the question is, is COVID-19, as it spreads throughout a property, uh, a direct physical loss? And the answer is complex. 
first, we don't have uh, any COVID-19 cases, and there are extremely few cases on uh, bacteria or virus type coverage. And those cases are largely distinguishable from uh, the COVID-19 cases. So what we have to do is we have to look for some cases that require uh, or that address other kinds of structural damage that exists with these policies. And let me just back up for one second. I wanted to mention that when looking at these issues, you know, there's a wide variety of views on whether or not business interruption coverage covers COVID-19. Um, on the one hand, you have some of the rating agencies that are saying that it's very unlikely to have an adverse impact on financial results. Uh, however, there are many uh, who are indicating that it could have coverage. We're trying to give you an objective overview on whether or not uh, coverage exists. Um, so as we go through, I, we're going to give you kind of both the pros and cons of of coverage, and uh, you know that that's I think important for you to uh, see. So um, sorry, when you look at some of these cases, they are very fact specific. These are the cases that required structural damage. And that may or may not be the case with COVID-19. Uh, structural damage often has been viewed by courts to mean some kind of physical property damage. Uh, and these cases, you know, even though, for example, here's a case, the Florida case is a case in which there was a restaurant that had dust and debris from a nearby construction project. Uh, and the court said that cleaning the restaurant and loss relating to that cleaning was not direct physical loss. You could make an analogy that that's like COVID-19, uh, uh, but you could also make distinctions from that. There are similar cases about bacteria in ductwork. Uh, for example, the Sixth Circuit case, uh, or the first of the Sixth Circuit cases was about that. Um, Sorry, let me just get back to, uh, so we have other cases that reach the opposite result. And let me just go through a few of these because they also are important, but they're also very fact specific. For example, the, the New Hampshire case that's listed there, you know, that case involved uh, the smell of cat urine from a neighboring apartment. And in that case, the court said that was a direct physical loss. Uh, but obviously, COVID-19 has much, much greater consequences uh, than a neighboring apartment smells. So, you know, it's hard to predict. Uh, but there are a number of cases that suggest that uh, something like um, COVID-19 may be covered. Uh, and uh, you can see they're kind of spread throughout the country. All right, let me get back to the next one. So what's important to know when you're thinking about this, uh, the policy language is going to be critical. The state's law that applies also will be important. Um, the facts of the property at issue is their evidence of COVID-19 on surfaces, or uh, is it some other quanti quality that makes COVID-19 present in the property? Or is it that the property has none? Um, and some of this is going to relate to whether there's a scientific consensus on what the virus how the virus is passed from person to person. We know it's through the air, but whether it's through uh, touching 
uh, tables and such, that's still an open question. Uh, depending upon the, the various scientists you hear. There are also causation questions that might be relevant here. Uh, for example, do you, um, are all of the damage related to, or all of your business loss related to the physical property damage? Courts differ on whether they require all of the damage to be linked to uh, physical loss or not. Um, and so that's going to be a critical issue as well. Um, let me move on to the next part. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I did want to mention on the last slide um, that my, might require expert opinion at a trial if there are coverage disputes about this on how the virus is transferred and whether the property had um, a direct physical loss. So another important part to talk about is the virus exclusions. Many, but not all, policies include some form of exclusion for loss due to virus. Um, the Insurance Services Office came out with an exclusion in part in response to the SARS outbreak um, in the early 2000s. I think that endorsement came out in 2006, but it's important to emphasize not every policy has this coverage. Um, and you can see here's the language of it. It's fairly broad and arguably would cover uh, COVID-19. Uh, and you can see that there's more policy language here about how it applies. Um, and one thing that's important in looking at your policy is does the exclusion apply to every coverage part? You see some policies where a virus exclusion may only apply to certain coverage, but not other coverages. And that may include not to uh, business interruption coverage. So that's going to be a critical issue. Uh, you've, I've seen other policies where it applies to not only business interruption, but perhaps to civil authority and other areas that we're going to talk about momentarily. Um, well, this slide's fairly uh, self-explanatory in terms of what the argument that will be made. Um, but, you know, insurers are going to argue that the exclusion has a broad application. Let me briefly talk about um, the current lawsuits. There are a number of them out there. Some were filed by restaurants in Louisiana. There's uh, the French Laundry case in California. Uh, there are a couple of casino cases and new lawsuits are being filed every day. I highlight this Big Onion Tavern Group lawsuit because um, the complaint, unlike some of the others, is really explains the coverage. It attaches the policy. It attaches the insurer's declination letter. Uh, this policy apparently is not subject to a uh, exclusion, a virus exclusion. I did not see it uh, in my review. Uh, I think the co if anybody wants the complaint, we can give it to you with the policy. The relevant language is it starts at about page 110, where they get into the coverage part. And what's important to note, this Big Onion is an example. The coverage language used there, they've got some ISO forms at the beginning, but then later on they're using, I wouldn't call it manuscript, but they're using the insurer's proprietary coverage, which seems to be partly ISO and partly uh, language adapted from other uh, policies, or perhaps they wrote it. So let me turn it over to Rebecca Woods to discuss uh, contingent business interruption. Hey, folks. Um, so contingent business interruption is a species of business interruption coverage. It is included in your property policy. If, if, if you have it, it would be included in your property policy. Um, and whereas Tom has been explaining how there might be coverage for damage to property related to the virus, to, to damage to your property, the CBI, the Contingent Business Interruption Coverage, is designed to provide insureds 
with coverage if something happens to somebody else's property that affects their own business. So for example, if you are, if you are, as noted on the slide here, a manufacturer of a mobile device that is dependent upon a chip made by a supplier, and that supplier has shut down uh, your, if it affects your business, you may want to invoke your CBI coverage. Um, it can affect, it can apply to not only uh, companies who have suppliers, it can also apply to companies with customers. So for example, um, in the 9-11 uh, instance, there were hotels near Disney World and World Trade Center who uh, sought to invoke their CBI coverage in order to, um, to, to recover those business losses, even though nothing happened to their own properties at that time. Um, so, uh, in terms of what kinds of coverage it provides, uh, it can provide lost replacement of lost income or revenues. It can uh, supply additional expense recovery, and it can help uh, provide expenses that your company paid to mitigate the losses. So going back to the chip example from the previous slide, um, if there were lost revenues, then uh, to the extent you can prove them and demonstrate them and provide the link to uh, the, the loss of your supplier, then you can get those lost revenues. Um, you can get, uh, if you had to select a different supplier, excuse me, um, and I've got to get back to my slide, uh, and it costs more to buy a chip, then you might get that delta as part of your insurance recovery. And uh, alternatively, if in order to mitigate your damages, you had to pay some uh, contracts to terminate them, if that's cheaper than your lost revenues, then there might be coverage for that. Um, the triggers for contingent business interruption coverage are identical to the triggers in your own business interruption. So the test that is applied that Tom talked about, that big outstanding issue was their physical damage to the property. That same test is going to be applied to the supplier who you claim had a loss that affected your business. Um, so all of the same arguments and tussles that insurers and insurers will be having in the coming months and years over these issues will also apply to contingent business interruption. Um, the, as as we, we probably can't say it enough in this uh, webinar, the policy language is absolutely critical. It, while there are ISO policies out there with standardized language, there's a lot of manuscripted policies out there, so you want to look at your policy very carefully to see what actually triggers your CBI coverage. And you want to watch out for the potential exclusions. Um, a number of these, particularly uh, thanks to the SARS epidemic, uh, exclude viruses or pandemics or biological agents. There might also be pollution exclusions. There's a lot of argument about whether those should really provide exclusions, but um, that is that's something to uh, look out for. And then in terms of limitations and general kind of best practices watch out for in the CBI context, there are very commonly sublimits and deductibles. So uh, it, while many of these CBI policies these days require specification of suppliers, and it's not just an amorphous any effect on your business, um, those suppliers might be sublimited, so your recovery might be limited there. Um, and nowadays, the CBI insurance is usually limited to your first-tier supplier. So if your supplier is fine, but the supplier they rely on to create something that eventually downstream winds up in your product is affected, then that CBI policy may not apply, again, subject to the terms. Um, there are frequently uh, waiting periods, and, and also along those lines with the deductibles, these waiting periods might be subject to a fight. Uh, you're going to you're going to want to read those pretty carefully because uh, sometimes there are challenges. Um, we saw one case where there was a 72-hour waiting period, um, and the insurer took the position that actually meant nine working days for the insured because the insured's business was only open eight hours a day. Um, so there's there's lots of room of wiggle there. Um, there's also a question whether there's uh, voluntary measures taken by the insured or whether there is um, a necessity. So uh, be, be thoughtful about what kinds of business decisions are being made to ensure that there isn't or to try and ensure that there isn't a fight with the insurer later. One, one current hot issue is without doubt the insurance market is hardening. 
Um, there's something called social inflation that insurers bake into their um, their premium analysis. Social inflation is basically the increase in insurance losses that are caused by things like, usually in the past, higher jury awards or um, uh, legislative changes. And Esther's going to talk about some uh, efforts to change the legislation. Here, there's expected to be social inflation around the expectation that many companies are going to be seeking to recover some financial damage as a result of this virus from their insurers. So what that's going to do is it's going to harden the insurance market. Uh, and to the extent that there are policies that are up for renewal that presently don't have exclusions for virus-related issues, those can be expected to be inserted. So if, if there's a claim to be made, there's a business consideration around the timing of when to make that claim. Um, and then the final note on that I'll note on the CBI coverage is the documentation requirements can be very sincere and challenging, and the policies are silent around what is required. So you're going to want to work carefully with risk managers and uh, experts and uh, track things very carefully to be able to show what was lost and how it was connected closely with uh, the claimed CBI coverage. And I'm going to hand this off now to... Um, Esther to talk about civil authority. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're going to talk about a topic that probably interests many of you, which is what about civil authority um, endorsements, which would potentially apply to shut down or shelter in place or stay at home orders uh, issued by local governments or state governments. And so there are several different standard endorsements. We're going to go through the three, um, the three most common endorsements, but as Rebecca mentioned earlier, it's important to remember that language matters and um, your policy may differ from the language here. So it's important to check your policies. This first slide is uh, the ISO endorsement form CP301012. And so you can see it's pretty detailed here. We'll give you a minute to look at that, and then we're just going to summarize it for you on the next slide. This endorsement requires an order from a civil authority, and the, again, that, that can be any level of government, but an order that prohibits access to the insured premises as a result of damage to other property that's within a mile of the insured premises. And the order is issued in response to a dangerous physical condition from damage or a covered per peril, or the order is issued to enable the government to have unimpeded access to the damaged property. And then, in addition to having that order, you must have a denial of access that causes loss. So the order, the denial of access, must cause you some loss. Um, this is. This endorsement is a pretty high standard. It's, it limits coverage to damage to nearby property, not any property, property that's within a mile. Some older policies may have language that refers to adjacent property. Um, it requires both property damage and dangerous physical conditions. So property damage alone isn't enough. The order must be issued in response to dangerous physical conditions unless it's issued to enable the government to have unimpeded access to damaged property. The latter one probably isn't going to be as common here. It'll be the former one um, arguing that coronavirus um, creates a dangerous physical condition. An alternative endorsement is a little bit shorter. You can see there it's easier to read than all that text on the prior endorsement. <laughs> and this endorsement requires an order that prohibits access to the insured premises that is issued as a result of damage, um, excuse the typo there, damage to other property. And so that damage has to be direct physical loss or damage to other property caused by a covered peril. So you have to have damage to the other property caused by a covered peril, and then the Denial of access to the insured's premises has to cause loss. So this is a broader endorsement. There's no limitation on the location of the other premises. Um, so it doesn't have to be within a, a mile. 
at least not on the language here. And there's no requirement of dangerous physical conditions or a need for unimpeded access, but it does require direct physical loss or damage, and it still requires the order to be caused by damage to other property. Then the other third one, third endorsement, is the broadest coverage. You can see there that this one requires an order that prohibits access to the insured premises as a result of a covered peril, and that order and resulting denial of access has to cause loss. You can see this is the broadest because what's not required here is property damage. And so again, you'll want to check your policies and see what you have because that's going to determine your potential coverage. This one doesn't require property damage, but it does require the order to be issued as a result of a covered peril. So some considerations here as we're talking about civil authority provisions. Some things you want to think about is, was there an order? Courts have generally interpreted the order requirement to require a mandate. A recommendation would not be sufficient um, or generally has not been held to be sufficient. So you want to look at that. Right now we have a lot of uh, talk about orders across the country from cities, from counties, from states. And um, sometimes they merely encourage people to stay inside. Sometimes they are mandatory. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of vagueness and um, confusion about the orders. And that is an area I would expect to see, we would expect to see litigation about and as it relates to these coverage positions. So for instance, um, Florida's order that the governor issued has a provision that says that senior citizens shall stay inside. It sounds mandatory, but the governor is now reporting that it's not mandatory. So is it mandatory or not? Um, other provisions in that order are mandatory, but that provision is unclear. Um, another thing to think about is maybe the order appears mandatory, but it's invalid. So for instance, some jurisdictions, I'm thinking of one large city in particular, uh, issued a 14-day shutdown order, um, but others argued that under the local law, the city had the authority to issue it for only 72 hours. So the question was, was it mandatory or not? Um, we would expect litigation over this. Uh, another question, was access prohibited? You want to think about what is access prohibited. And um, sometimes decisions focus on people, and sometimes they focus on the property. Um, they focus on whether it's a direct prohibition or an indirect prohibition. It, it varies with the courts. Litigation in the past on access has involved limitations on the means of access. So um, think of it as prohibitions on categories of access or prohibitions that made access difficult. For instance, post 9-11, um, airports were shut down. And so there were some insureds that sued alleging that the um, shutdown of the airports uh, impeded access to their business. And in, those cases courts held well. It limited a category of access, but it didn't deny access completely to your property. People could get there by car or by train. Um, but in the various cases, people could still have access to the property. It was just difficult. So something we may see here is uh, our arguments that the closures here limit all access to some people. Um, so we would expect to see uh, insureds pointing out that the closures limit all access to some people, um, while insurers may point out that there are still categories of people that are permitted access. So for instance, many of the shutdown orders include exceptions for um, people to secure the business. Um, and in the prior litigation, there isn't there isn't um, case law that's quite exactly the same as here, where you have whole categories of people that are prohibited from going out and going to a, a business. Also consider 
was the order a result of the property damage? So here you want to look at, consider, was there actual damage or was damage just expected? As an example, post 9-11, uh, there was, again, litigation about shutdowns of airports, shutdowns of property surrounding uh, the Pentagon and surrounding uh, the towers. Um, and some courts held that um, some of the shutdowns were due to fear of future terroristic attacks. So, for example, that uh, when airports were shut down, that that shutdown was not because of the damage that was already done. It was shut down due to fear of future damage, future attacks. Similarly, there was a case um, involving Hurricane Katrina and Mayor Nagan, and the court uh, there held that the shutdown was at one point, because there were multiple shutdowns, at one point the shutdown was fear of future damage, that the damage, the hurricane had not yet come, so there was no damage yet. On the other hand, in a Georgia case, a court held that where a local authority issued an evacuation order after hearing about property damage in nearby islands, that that did involve property damage. And again, this is why your policy terms are important. In the Hurricane Katrina case, that policy had the one mile limitation. It required damage to property within a mile. In the Georgia case, it had the kind of the middle language similar to the middle endorsement we looked at where it just required damage to property, to other property. Um, these are also an example of where facts are going to be important. In the Georgia case, the local government authorities testified that they had watched the news, seen the damage in the nearby islands to property, and then issued the evacuation order. So it'll be important, uh, for instance, why local orders, why state orders were issued. You can look at things like the whereas clauses in the order or public statements made about the orders. Um, also, consider whether the damage was caused by a covered peril. And then last, when did the order begin and end? And here you have orders that um, often the coverage doesn't begin until 72 hours after the order. So that first endorsement we looked at, that standard endorsement has a provision stating that coverage begins 72 hours later after the order. So it's important to see when the order begins and when it ends. And then we would expect that issues will arise with overlapping orders. What if, for instance, a city issues an order that's good for 72 hours and then right before it expires, the state issues an order that is good for the next month? How does that impact coverage? Does it restart the clock or doesn't it? And now we'll go to something that's related, which is ingress and egress coverage. Thanks, Esther. Um, before I talk about that for very briefly, um, we've received a number of questions. We're doing pretty well on time. Hopefully we will be able to address those questions uh, at the end of the discussion. Um, one common question is, will the PowerPoint slides be available? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and I think they're being emailed to people who have requested them, um, but there might be a broader uh, publication of them. Um, let me just kind of review where we have been. So far, we've still really been focused on uh, commercial property policies, which provide a lot of different types of coverage in addition to damage to the property. Uh, and in particular, they may provide business interruption coverage, but there are a lot of questions about whether those are subject to exclusions like bacteria and virus exclusions, or uh, whether there needs to be a, a physical uh, manifestation of property damage at the property. Uh, and you can see that you know, the, the language varies and some policies would provide coverage and some policies may not. 
Um, the as Esther was talking about civil authority coverage, the ingress and egress is similar. Um, it differs in that you can't access your property often because there is some physical impediment to that. So an example would be if there was a tornado uh, and the tornado prevented you from accessing your property because of damages to neighboring property, um, or it could be damage to your property. Uh, this could apply, particularly if you don't have a broad form of uh, civil authority type of coverage in the policy. Uh, so another area to look at. Um, sticking with the um, the idea of provisions that might be in the commercial uh, property policy, um, but also might be in separate policies, uh, is separate virus coverage. So uh, as a result of some significant losses and as a result of the industry uh, limiting coverage with virus exclusions, there are insurers who uh, decided to market uh, virus coverage. Uh, the hospitality industry, uh, hotels in particular, often had this kind of coverage, and we quote the language here. So you can see it's fairly broad. Uh, the type of disease should be covered under this uh, policy. You can see the, I quote here, the, the communicable disease that's referred to in these hotel policies often are defined broadly. Um, sometimes, though, they're limited to human-to-human -human transmission. Typically, that would be uh, COVID-19 as we understand it, but, um, you know, the, you might make an argument, well, if it's that the uh, table, for example, or furniture or banister was contaminated, is that human to human? I think that's kind of a stretch in terms of a coverage limitation, but I wouldn't be surprised to see litigation out of that. Let's talk about a, a totally standalone kind of coverage. There was a, a a type of coverage that was put together by Marsh and Munich Re was underwriting it, and I think there were some others involved as well. Uh, you could see it was developed in 2018. The, the problem with this coverage is I haven't been able to find um, anyone who has actually purchased it. It might be out there. People may have purchased it, but there just haven't been disputes about it. If people have purchased it, it could be quite effective for COVID-19 losses. Let me mention, because I've seen articles and other periodicals about it, um, ISO, the Insurance Services Office, came out with endorsements in February 2020 for future COVID-19 potentially losses. The problem with this coverage is I don't think that any insurer would uh, issue it, uh, at least not right now. I, I think these endorsements have been overcome by events at that time um, in February. You know, things look very different than they do now in early April. Um, but if you were lucky enough to obtain this kind of coverage in that short period, uh, you could be in pretty good shape. Um, so now I'll turn it back to Esther to talk about a very hot topic, which is what's happening with the legislative and regulatory activities. Thanks, Tom. So we know this is a lot of interest to people. Um, there is much going on legislatively right now, both at the federal level and at the state level. Um, at the federal level right now, there is um, work in Congress about a recovery fund, nothing um, unless it was just introduced before we got on this uh, webinar. Um, the bill has not yet been introduced, but Congress members are working on a recovery fund. 
This fund would institute a program with the U.S. Treasury to distribute funds to businesses to cover their business interruption losses from COVID-19. It would be set up in a way that would allow insurers, agents, and brokers to help with the application filing and review of the application. And um, this would be retroactive in a sense. In other words, it would cover past losses. Um, so you would submit your claim after the loss. But it, this would not affect um, the coverage available under insurance policies. So this would be a recovery fund separate from insurance. But the idea is uh, to help businesses because um, just across the country, businesses are being hit so hard by the pandemic. Another thing that's being considered is the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act. Uh, this would be an act similar to TRIA. Um, and this would be prospective only. So again, we're looking at creating a special, a special law to help ensure that there is insurance for pandemics going forward. But again, it's, retro, it's uh, prospective only, not retrospective. Then at the state level, we're seeing um, various states talk about expansion of business interruption insurance coverage. This would be retroactive. So that, um, several states have introduced bills to uh, retroactively expand the coverage in existing policies. Um, Rhode Island bill has not yet been introduced. Um, a representative announced he was working on it. but. Um, you can see the other states listed there, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Ohio have had bills introduced. Um, the bills have not yet been enacted, and there are um, potential legal challenges. It's uh, unclear whether the bills, if they became law, would survive the legal challenges. Um, there's a constitutional, there are constitutional challenges, for instance, uh, under the contract clause under the takings clause and potentially, depending on how the laws are drafted, under equal protection laws if some insurers are treated differently than others. Um, in the past, there have been constitutional challenges to revisions to insurance contracts. Um, in, sometimes those are upheld, sometimes they have not been upheld. But a key consideration in those cases is the impact on insurers and whether insurers would still be able to be profitable or whether the, um, the legislation would essentially bankrupt insurers. And so that is, that is a potential concern here, given the scope of the losses. Um, David Sampson, CEO of American Property Casualty Insurance, has come out and said that he estimates that there's a 220 to 383 billion uh, dollars of losses per month, and that the total surplus for all of the U.S. home and auto and business insurers combined to pay future losses is only about $800 billion. So you could see how the losses could exceed capacity to pay them. So that will be a concern um, and likely will be litigated if any of these laws are enacted. Then there is an issue of contractual, just states have varying laws on how insurance contracts are to be interpreted and how they can be amended, uh, which could bear on the legality of the laws. And then an extraterritorial issue. Um, the laws vary on who they apply to, some are unclear. So uh, we would expect courts to be looking at, you know, was the law limited to insurers in that state? Was it limited to insureds in that state? Was it limited to losses in that state? Um, the broader a law is, the greater it's subject to challenge. So if a state law applies potentially to every insurer anywhere, wherever they issued insurance and wherever the loss was, um, that could uh, pose a greater challenge for enforceability. And then there will be practical challenges. So some of these laws are being drafted by legislature, legislators who may have a limited understanding of insurance policies and how they work. And you can see that in some of the language in the policies. For, 
I'm sorry, in the laws. For example, in New York, New York, uh, the New York bill says that covered perils will include coverage for business interruption during a declared state of emergency due to a pandemic. Well, um, typically the business interruption isn't the covered peril. The business interruption results from a covered peril. Um, so just you can see the challenges there. Even if these laws are upheld, there will be challenges both for insureds and insurers in understanding how the law applies and to an existing policy and what effect it will have on it. Um, because if, for example, the law simply negates virus exclusions, that may help insureds, but ultimately um, it may not result in greater coverage if other provisions of the policy don't provide for coverage. So it, it's not it's not necessarily a panacea, and so those are things we're going to want to watch as we see this legislation move forward. So our next slide is about event cancellation coverage. Thanks, Esther. Um, this one we'll just cover super briefly. This is standalone coverage that uh, you may your company may have bought for some sort of specific event. Um, the trigger is usually defined, um, and you might you might these are so unique. You just have to look at the nature of the policy. The two highlights I would note here is uh, many of these event cancellations require that the uh, event be canceled for reasons beyond the control of the insured. And I know a lot of companies have decided to shut things down, arguably voluntarily, in light of the virus. Uh, so there's going to be some discussion to be had with the insurer around those issues, and judgment calls are tricky. Um, but uh, clearly what we've all seen in the last month is that uh, what seemed optional maybe two weeks ago just isn't anymore. So there might just be a matter of timing and argument to be had there. Um, many of these policies also have a communicable disease exclusion, um, and many of them define communicable disease as one in which the World Health Organization has declared an epidemic or pandemic. So if you have one of these policies, if you've gone ahead and canceled something, um, look at the timing because on March 11, that uh, exclusion for communicable disease arguably was triggered by the World Health Organization's declaration. So moving on to the uh, travel insurance. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm going to cover this briefly as well. There was a lot of activity a few weeks ago about travel insurance. Um, there are two types, very broadly, of course, it's all in the specifics of the policy, but there's a cancel for any reason policy uh, that is broad and may apply or the covers may apply for that it, it seems like it would if the language is as broad as uh, many policies are and then there are policies that have enumerated events so an example of an enumerated event that might apply here would be the sickness of the traveler uh, if they're diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 obviously that would uh, or, or arguably should be covered. Uh, the um, If a family member is diagnosed of that or maybe another condition, that arguably would be covered as well. But some events are not. And in the past, uh, insurers ha have, some insurers have taken the per, uh, position that with the language of some of these policies that um, viruses are foreseeable events. So for example, if you had uh, an event that was scheduled in uh, June um, and you cancel now, you know, the argument might be that it was foreseeable. Um, there have been enough denials of coverage that a subcommittee of the House Oversight and Reform Committee has um, ask questions of major travel insurers, um, basically along the lines of discovery, and has 
uh, attempted to get them to respond uh, through a deposition-like or question-answer uh, format. Um, the, as far as I can tell, the insurers have uh, declined to do that, and the subcommittee has not issued a subpoena. I will say this subcommittee is um, kind of the, on the more aggressive, uh, liberal, pro-consumer bent, which is not a knock on it. I'm not making a political de decision, but what I'm saying is that uh, while there might be some effort to get relief in the House, whether they can um, get any legislation through the Senate and the president uh, is somewhat doubtful. Um, let me just say, we're, we're now about to go to move away from the first party coverage and go to uh, the uh, third party liability coverage. But let me just address a few issues before we conclude uh, on that. Um, if you have any uh, questions about what we've written that we can't get to, you should feel free to contact us. Our email addresses are at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation will be uh, sent to all uh, people who have participated in this call, so you should get that. Um, but let, let me keep moving on so we can save a little time for questions. So we're going to briefly talk about three types of third-party liability coverage issues. Uh, that is basically uh, general liability coverage for uh, bodily injury or the failure to prevent uh, virus from being spread, uh, and then discrimination type retaliation issues that uh, might arise, and then shareholder claims uh, relating to DNO coverage. Uh, there are many other types of liability policies and coverages that may be implicated. We just don't have time to uh, touch on them all. But let me turn it over to Rebecca for um, a discussion about the CGL coverage. Thanks, Tom. Um, and everybody who's listening, you're going to want to take down the CLE code, which was announced at the beginning you need in order to get your CLE credit, the CLE code is FS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 7515. Again, it is SS7515. All right, CGL coverage. Um, so we've been talking about those first party claims where something has happened to your company and you are making a claim. In these instances, uh, CGL coverage is there to respond when something happens, bodily injury or property damage, to somebody else, and they claim that your company is responsible for it. Um, we're already seeing lawsuits being filed uh, and that are almost certainly uh, going to trigger CGL coverage subject to various exclusions. For example, uh, we all know the, the dire situation on the Princess Cruise Line. Um, on March 13, a lawsuit was filed alleging that the cruise was negligent in allowing another cruise to leave when the cruise line knew that people potentially had coronavirus who, well, people definitely had coronavirus who had been on that cruise ship and had exited and that staff remained on board for the next uh, cruise when those staff had interacted potentially with uh, corona-infected people. Um, so uh, those claims are poor screening protocols and failure to warn. So this coverage is there if your company faces claims that somebody has been hurt and uh, or some property of somebody else's has been damaged. Um, there are, I've seen a couple of questions pop up around employees and while uh, one was uh, regarding sending an employee to a work site who gets sick and another question pertained to letting employees visit a customer site uh, with the customer's permission and the employee gets sick. It is possible that the CGL policy would respond um, but uh, as with any good insurance program, there are other policies out there that might respond, and you're going to want to look at your workers' comp policy, particularly for employees who are in the ordinary course of business getting sick. It's an open question whether workers' comp will respond. Uh, they ordinarily uh, 
exclude uh, the so-called ordinary diseases of life, but there may be arguments to be made. Um, and then if there are variants of the claim by employees that are separate from their actual bodily injury, but for example, relate to lost, loss of employment, your EPLI policy might respond. Um, so those are the, the three bodily injury policies that you're going to want to look at if you're dealing with employee and coronavirus issues. But going back to the commercial liability policies, um, there are standard exclusions that uh, may or may not apply. The pollution exclusion Tom talked about a little bit. Uh, there's, it's, it, doesn't seem to, it doesn't specify viruses, so there is argument to be had as to whether that the coverage would be excluded under that exclusion. There is, in some policies, and we're going to see a lot more of it in the future, something called a communicable disease exclusion that would almost certainly shut down these claims. But again, all the terms matter of the policy, so everything should be looked at carefully. Um, and uh, the accident, uh, I note here on the slide that the damage must be caused by an accident. And that is because insurance, particularly CGL coverage, but really all insurance, is there to cover something that was fortuitous. It was not uh, done intentionally and wasn't clearly foreseen. Um, it, it seems that there are reasonable arguments that all of this bodily injury is, uh, in fact, fortuitous and is an accident. But something to think about strategically as the longer this pandemic lasts and the longer that entities have notice of the, the likely the way of the means of transmission, companies are going to want to take precautions and be able to point their insurers, if they're making claims later, to all of the reasonable steps they, they took in order to prevent infection, um, and that will help fortify any arguments that uh, the infection was not an accident. All right, moving on to discrimination and retaliation coverage. This would depend on the uh, policy at issue, but here are some examples where you might see some claims. Um, the high-risk categories are senior citizens and uh, people with pre-existing conditions. And so um, you may see an employee who alleges discrimination and adverse action based on his age or his health status. And here are some examples. A disabled employee um, is terminated after he declines to work in the office due to the COVID-19 risk. Um, or an employer decides um, we're going to go ahead and furlough employees who are 65 and older because um, we don't want them to get sick and they're higher risk, and so they go ahead and furlough them. Or another area outside of employment where you um, might see people trying to make claims is based on an alleged denial of service due to their status, due to their age, or due to their health. So for instance, if it's possible, we could see people alleging that you decline to provide services to nursing homes because of the risk. And so um, those are just issues that may appear. Um, I don't think there have been any cases filed on that yet, but we could see that in the future. So let me talk for a few moments about potential directors and officers issues. Um, the SEC a month ago issued a press release warning uh, companies to inform investors of coronavirus-related risks. If the companies failed to do so, that could give rise to lawsuits, and the most applicable policy would be the director's and officer's policy. Um, we have seen some, but not many, shareholder suits. Uh, you know, arguments are that uh, the company failed to take the necessary steps, whether that was uh, preparing the workforce uh, for hospitals that, for example, could be getting personal protective equipment. Um, there are a wide variety of scenarios where that could come up. Um, and all of these things led to a drop in the stock price, there are going to be significant causation issues about whether it was the failure or the government shutdown. I think that uh, the shareholder suits are going to be tough to pursue, but um, in any case, the 
policyholders and the directors and officers are going to want to uh, look to their DNO policies for potential coverage. Now, some DNO policies have um, bodily injury uh, exclusions. This really is different. The, when you have a shareholder suit, although it relates to bodily injury that the corporation allegedly may have caused, um, really, it's more focused on the drop in share price or the failure to take some action. Um, you know, as I said, with the hospitals, it's probably a closer question. Are you looking at uh, different kinds of policies than a DNO policy? But it, it depends on the allegations. The shareholder suits, uh, the, the bodily injury exclusion arguably should not apply for that. Um, so we are at our hour. Uh, let me just uh, scroll through a few other things to see if we can. Uh, um, again, we have a website for all sorts of uh, COVID-19 related issues and uh, please look at that because it could answer a lot of questions. Our contact information is included. Um, sorry, I skipped over Rebecca. I want to make sure you see her there. Um, with You can see our phone numbers and our uh, email addresses. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, some of the questions that were asked are pretty specific, and I think what we're going to try to do is follow up with you separately uh, because I, we probably would need some more information. But let me turn it over to Rebecca and see if there are any questions that we can uh, answer in the last few minutes. Um, well, there are a number on builder's risk, and what I would say is uh, likely builder's risk is not going to respond. Um, it is not there to protect against natural disasters or employee injuries. You're going to want to look to see if there's an OSIP or a CSIP, because those might pull in the property or CGL policies and the, bring the potential for the kinds of coverage we've been talking about. Um, Tom, there was, a, there was a question about, does the virus cause direct physical damage? And... Um, I don't know, I, maybe you should end on that because that's kind of the marquee question of this of this webinar. Yeah, and I wish I could give everyone a definitive answer, and the only answer I can give is it depends. It depends on the policy language. The physical loss requirement is different for pol from policy to policy. And one word omitted or added can change uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, state law will be relevant. Um, speaking of state law, you know, there are these legislative activities. If they get passed, as Esther said, there's a lot going to be a lot of challenges. Um, you know, factor that in. Don't count on a legislature um, resolving or uh, signing and acting a bill uh, to solve your problems. But going back to the physical uh, damage, um, you know, there are going to be causal connections and there's going to be issues about what it is at your property or at a surrounding property that caused, that it, that is the nature of the physical damage. And unfortunately, there could be disputes that result in litigation um, and, you know, it may turn on what does the CDC or other medical experts say about uh, what what causes COVID-19 to be transmitted? Uh, so I could make a very good argument that uh, if a table or a banister or a space uh, had COVID-19 in it, uh, like you see on the cruise lines, um, I think there was one cruise ship that said they had COVID-19 that was found 19 or 27 days later, that that would be direct physical loss. Uh, but I could see others making an argument to say, well, but that's, is it communicable at 27 days out? Um, I think there are going to be a lot of expert questions. In general, I would say advice is provide notice, 
to your broker and your and make sure the broker provides notice to the uh, company that you're making a claim, the insurer that you're making a claim. Document your losses. That's going to be critical. It's critical in any first party property uh, insurance coverage. Uh, you really need to document your losses and if possible, mitigate uh, your uh, losses. Not always possible, particularly if there's a civil authority that has shut down uh, the area. But if you can uh, try to mitigate your losses, um, you know, there are going to be complex issues about what profits have been lost, uh, what was done to clean up, um, what could be done to clean up. Uh, the other reason for giving notice is because some of these policies provide coverage for cleanup. And some policies arguably even provide coverage for public relations associated with what happened at the property. So, again, just be um, be aware that there are, there are lots of different types of potential coverages that may, be, may apply. Uh, and I think we're we're really out of time now. Again, we'll try to follow up with everyone um, who's asked questions to make sure that uh, your questions are answered by us or someone else at our firm. And with that, I guess we'll sign off. I'll turn it back over to our uh, call administrator. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.